Welcome to Republican Roundtable. I'm your host, Max Reimer. We find ourselves on the heels of another mass shooting in America, a tragedy, one in Ohio and one in Texas. Our guest today is Brian Strausser of the Minnesota Gun Owners Caucus. And Brian, we don't like meeting under these circumstances necessarily, but we wanted to have you back on the show to talk about some of the associated rhetoric that has happened since those shootings, what the Gun Owners Caucus is kind of doing about that rhetoric, and what some solutions are to these types of, of tragedies in America. So welcome to the Thank Republican Roundtable. Yeah, thanks for having me. So uh, before we kind of dive into that, I know I covered it in the intro, but what has the Minnesota Gun Owners Caucus been doing uh, since last session ended? Well, since the session ended, we took a little bit of time off, I think, to just relax and, and recover from uh, a long session and a, and a very rapid uh, special session that went on for you know 36 hours or so. Mm -hmm. But since then, we've been engaged in a number of events across the state. And then following the incidents that you talked about in the introduction, We've really been working with legislators, uh, the press, and others on talking about what has happened and what potential solutions are, our opposition to gun control measures, and then what are some things that we might be able to pursue in the 2020 legislative session. Well, let's talk about those solutions because it seems like, and this is the normal doldrum of rhetoric that comes mm -hmm. out of events like this, uh, Republicans, conservatives, gun groups, they are, they're not actually proposing anything that will make sense or actually reduce gun violence. One, what is your assessment, Brian Strausser, on these types of shootings? What does the data tell you causes them? And two, what is a reasonable solution? What are things that we can talk about? Mm -hmm. Well, first, let's talk about what causes these events. And the answer is we don't really know. Um, the research that's out there, there, there's a great report from the FBI about the pre-attack indicators and pre-attack behaviors of mass shooters, and it covers about 15 years of time. And the FBI's summary of that can really be outlined as there is no one single indicator that you can look at and say that person or that you know, threatened individual is the one that's gonna be the next mass shooter. Sure. But what you can look at and say is that um, social isolation, uh, bullying or violent behavior, people who commit domestic violence, people who are disgruntled in the workplace, and to some extent, people who have exhibited signs of dangerous mental illness, not depression or things like that, but you know, dangerous, mentally ill-driven behavior. Those are indicators that in combination might indicate that a person has a tendency to engage in, this, in a potential mass shooting mm -hmm. or other type of attack. Is there a legislative solution to address any of that? It seems, because it's tough, right? It puts mm -hmm. us in a position where we understand our rights, mm -hmm. we understand what we have guaranteed to us in the Constitution of the United States, but at the same time, it's like the things you just addressed, I mean, my goodness, there, there's nothing that you, you or I, it seems, from afar could do, could do mm -hmm. anything about. There are some things that I think legislators could do that would help in some of these areas. You know, we can, we can look at, um, in the K through 12 education environment, in our, in our elementary, middle, and, and particularly high schools, we can look at school counselors and make sure we've staffed and funded those positions appropriately. We can look at the best practices around things like using the principles of threat assessment in those schools to make sure that individuals that are at risk get the help and care that they need so they don't evolve into mass shootings. Mm -hmm. We can educate the public as well that individuals who make threatening comments, who engage in violent behavior at work, who commit domestic violence, that these things are being reported so that law enforcement and others can act in it. Mm -hmm. Of course, we do know also that in some cases, like the, the shooter in the Parkland, Florida case a year ago, um, when they have 33, 34 encounters with law enforcement, it never led to an arrest or any follow-up. So there is an impetus here too that law enforcement needs to follow up on those things when they happen. It seems like two main, from anti-gun groups, which by the way, I mean, I, and I want you to speak to this before we dive into the red flag laws and the background checks, so it seems to be the two most popular uh, policy prescriptions coming out of these shootings. But what I noticed was you had presidential politicians, local politicians, local uh, media figures, things of that nature, basically running fundraising emails off of these tragedies. Mm -hmm. Where to even begin about something that heinous? When you see that type of rhetoric coming out of, the, uh, out of these events where the, the bodies aren't even cold yet, mm -hmm. does, that, does that discourage you at all from finding common ground, from actually finding a solution with a, a side who is willing to 
to go that far. I don't know if we'll ever necessarily find common ground on a number of issues around this topic with the other side, so to speak, because they truly do believe that gun control is the answer here, whereas we don't. So I think mm -hmm. we're at kind of polar opposites. The middle ground that can be found, I think, has nothing to do with gun control and everything to do with some of the solutions that we were talking about. Or, or here's a simple one I think that we could agree on. Um, Minnesota, since 2015, has had a law that if you have a permanent order of protection in place for a domestic violence incident, mm -hmm. which means both parties have been in front of a judge and the judge has ruled, you know, you're going to have to stay away from this person and because there's a weapon involved, you're going to forfeit your right to keep and bear arms. Mm -hmm. So there's been due process, so to speak. Um, that's enforced 6% of the time. Okay. Uh, Carol Levin did this uh, back, at, I think, two years ago now. Mm -hmm. So is there, could there be common ground in, you know, let's find the right legislative solution to change that yeah. so it's more 95 96% enforcement instead of 6% right. enforcement? I think we can find some middle ground there. But the fundraising after a tragedy is, I mean, it's just kind of disgusting. Yeah, I cannot believe some of the emails that were being written by presidential candidates mm -hmm. and things of that nature. As you mentioned, there is already a law on the books, apparently, that you, know, you go through your due process, and if you have a permanent, you, there, there's a permanent situation that comes out of a uh, domestic dispute or what have you. What is the difference between that and one of the major policy prescriptions that have come from the left in the red flag laws? Can you explain what that policy proposal is and why it's dangerous? Is so the, it dangerous? The, I think it's very dangerous as it is currently written. Um, and and there's, it's important to note there's a number of versions of red flag bills that are out there. I'm going to talk about what's in the Minnesota version, mm -hmm. but there is one that's being debated by some Republicans uh, in the U.S. Congress that's different than this, that, and we can get into that if you want to go down that road. But the, the Minnesota law, um, uh, um, Senator Ron Latz is the chief author in the Senate. Uh, Representative Ruth Richardson is the chief author in the House. This bill was heard and passed in the House as a part of the omnibus public safety bill, and then it got struck down in conference committee, so it didn't become law. Okay. But what this bill allows are really two paths to taking or seizing, confiscating someone's firearms. The first path is uh, law enforcement files a routine red flag order petition. There's a hearing scheduled. There, uh, they have to allege certain types of behavior that would indicate that the gun owner is a, uh, a threat um, a danger to themselves or others is the okay. way the law is written. And there's some criteria in the law, in the bill, for sure. what that means. And then the judge schedules an adversarial hearing. The gun owner's notified. They both appear. The law, the prosecutor or, or uh, represented by the, the county attorney and the gun owner represented by their attorney, and they have the debate in front of the judge. You could argue there's good due process there. We would argue the standard of proof is extremely low. Because to be clear, uh, the gun is the gun is ta taken prior to that hearing. No, the, in, the, in this path, the gun is not taken until after the guns okay. are not taken until after the hearing. Okay. The exigent circumstances path is, which I think is what would be followed almost every time, is the law enforcement makes the filing and then says there's an imminent danger of harm to self or others. Sure. There's an ex parte hearing immediately. The gun owner is not notified and is not represented. The judge decides what's to do. Law enforcement shows up, seizes the firearms. Mm -hmm. They leave behind, of course, every other weapon that you could use, a knife, an ax, uh, your vehicle, sure. uh, gasoline. I mean, the list yeah. is, is limitless. Certain materials uh, to make a bomb Certain or materials whatever. to make explosives and what have you. And then if and only if the gun owner files for a hearing, then there'll be a hearing. I think it's within 21 days or 14 days. Mm -hmm. And then you'll have the debate again about, then you'll have that adversarial hearing. You'll have your so-called day in court. Um, and then the judge will rule. And if the judge rules to seize your firearms, they set a time period between six months and two years. Okay. And then you can come back and argue again. Okay. And now the burden's on you to and, prove and, that you're and not. And again, six months to two years, and Correct. then you get to argue again. You get to argue again. It's there's not just no a, guarantee. Right. That's incredible. The, uh, um, there's been a lot of press coverage, obviously, the last couple of weeks about red flag laws. Yes. The Washington Post, I thought, had an interesting article last week which said that red flag laws have mixed results. Um, but the best part of the article, which I thought did a fair job of explaining where it's working and where there are challenges, is the San Diego, California district attorney who said, I look for ways to exploit the law to seize firearms from gun owners. So, said those exact words? I look for ways to exploit the law to seize firearms. And it's San Diego, California that Ruth Richardson, Representative Richardson, testified that she spoke with and as she drafted the bill. 
why is so the exploitation thing that happens across the country number of different mm -hmm. laws Correct. and unfortunately that's unsurprising why from a gun owner's rights perspective what is your argument that that is totally unconstitutional it does not give you your rights is it is it more the fact that they're creating an extra judicial process or what is the argument against red flag laws from the gun owners caucus well i think the the simple constitutional argument or philosophical argument is that the constitution says the right to keep and bear arms shall not be infringed mm -hmm. The more realistic argument, I think, if to get into what we have to argue in front of the legislature instead of just saying that, yeah. is that this bill lacks due process. That in most cases, the gun owner's firearm is going to be seized uh, in an ex through an ex parte hearing process, and now the onus is going to be on them to prove that they're not a danger to themselves or others. Mm -hmm. It's also interesting to us that from the get-go, the law was written so that the standard of proof required to issue the order is about here on the scale of, you know, up to, up to uh, beyond a reasonable doubt. Sure. It's about here. Yeah. For the gunner to get their firearm back once it's been seized, the barrier is now up to here. It's right. clear and convincing evidence. Well, that's pretty high. Yeah. So why the disparity in, we only have to prove this to take your guns, you have to prove this to get your firearms back. And what psychologist or psychiatrist in a harm to self case is going to go on the record in front of a judge and said, "Yeah, this person is not a danger to themselves." Right, and in a world where you have uh, younger people swatting each other, playing video games, mm -hmm. and words are meaning less and less these days, the mere accusation of Brian Strausser is a threat because X, Y, Z. I saw him post this on social media. Mm -hmm. Those things can be left up to interpretation for law enforcement. Well, and once the right? laws passed, what happens the next time around in the legislature? Maryland right now is, uh, who has had a red flag law for I believe two years, is looking to expand the definitions and expand the individuals that are allowed to file for a red flag from law enforcement to family, to teachers, to your doctor, to sport coaches. I can't remember the list, there's seven yeah. or eight categories. Um, and then we have cases, I mean we have a case here in Minnesota where um, Protect Minnesota, the state-based anti-gun group, made a posting uh, last summer when this law was being kind of debated in the public eye following Parkland about a guy who shows up at an event wearing a Trump hat and a carrying a firearm. And they said, well, this is a perfect example of someone who we need a red flag law for, because why would you do that? Knowing nothing else about Knowing the Knowing nothing else about the circumstance. Except and he was carrying an American flag too, just not to leave sure. that out. Sure, But why is, people that do this all the time. Yeah, what is that criteria? <laughs> right. And that is the dangerous slippery slope, I think, for our audience to understand mm -hmm. is especially, and you know this, the the activists who are part of that group who act in bad faith and who accuse in bad faith for mm -hmm. a political motivation, as well as just general indivisible activists who we have in the district who mm -hmm. actually accuse politicians of things that they know are not true in bad faith, that this is the road that we go down, I think, when we actually enact these laws. And that brings me to my next point, which I think our audience is should also keenly understand, was that Mitch McConnell in the Senate and Donald Trump have both come out and said this is a priority. Mm -hmm. That's disturbing. And what I'm wondering, and you act independently as the Gun Owners Caucus in defending people's Second Amendment right, but Brian, how do we approach our own politicians who are on our own side and convince them that this is a bad idea? It's, it's much easier, I think, to, to know that somebody is... Uh, on the left, and fundamentally we have a disagreement about life philosophy and mm -hmm. things of that nature, but when it's a Republican politician, how do you guys, as the Gun Owners Caucus, up approach these people? Well, I, I, there's a couple things that I think can be done. There are definitely cases where um, legislators don't understand the issue, and so there is an opportunity to educate them, assuming they're open to that education, right? Some DFLers in Minnesota are not open to that on the gun issue mm -hmm. or won't meet with us. Flat out will not, no, I don't want to talk with you. Which is fine, that's their right to do so. Mm -hmm. But sometimes there's an opportunity for education. Um, I think the second is just pointing out examples of where Republicans in particular or um, elected officials in certain parts of the state that are, have more gun owners than others, like the Iron Range, I think it's important to point out just political examples of where this doesn't work for you. Um, Dario Anselmo, Representative Anselmo, is an example of that, who did everything a gun, act, a gun control activist in Minnesota would want, um, got endorsed 
even got endorsed or uh, got the special uh, Orange Star designation as a supporter of uh, gun control initiatives from gun groups or anti-gun groups. And then the gun control organizations campaigned for his opponent, donated to his opponent, uh, spent independently for his opponent. Mm. So it didn't gain him anything. And all of the folks that were on the left weren't going to vote for him anyway because he was a Republican. So somebody's just pointing out the political reality of, okay, so you're going to support some of these measures. Well, here's what that looks like in Minnesota when you do. Mm -hmm. And then there's the accountability piece. You support this, and we're going to make sure that people in your district know when it came down to the wire, what side of the fence you fell on. Right, and you, with, with Dario Anselmo, uh, you know, he's a guy who really believed in mm -hmm. that. Absolutely. Where I think, you know, Donald Trump, the administration, this guy ran on being a Second Amendment champion. He talked about how, you know, he had guns in his home and mm -hmm. that kind of thing. And same with Mitch McConnell. It seems like they think that this is the politically popular or expedient route to go, and I think, you have a very passionate base of people that mm -hmm. make their decisions well, on think, these elections. I, I think federally, um, I, the president, I think it's hard to know where he stands on things because sure. it changes, right? He made some comments this morning about the Second Amendment that, and gun control that were totally opposite of what he was saying three or four days ago. So where he lands in the end, I, I don't think any of us really know. Mm -hmm. um, all McConnell has said is it'll be a priority for discussion. Sure. He hasn't committed to any legislation in any way. Okay. Um, I mean, certainly I think we need to watch carefully what the Senate does. We do have folks there that are proposing things like Marco Rubio and Lindsey Graham that I think make us nervous. Um, but McConnell's a pretty sly fox. I don't know where he's going sure. quite yet. You're, you're right about that. The, the tortoise, he, he does have his ways. <laughs> um, the other piece of legislation that seems to be the popular policy prescription coming out of these two specific tragedies um, is the background checks. And I know we covered that a little bit last time, but for mm -hmm. our audience, what are they proposing that's new or different than what our current system is? So there's kind of two things being proposed. Federally, what has been proposed and what the House has passed, the U.S. Congress has passed, is a law that says, if, with a few exceptions, if you're going to engage in the private sale, like I'm going to sell you a firearm, mm -hmm. Under current law, you and I can just make this deal and we can leave the studio and you can give me money and I can sell you a gun um, because I don't know that you're not prohibited to my knowledge. Sure. Um, what, there, what the federal law that's been being proposed is we couldn't do that, that would be illegal and we would need to go to a dealer and do the transaction through the dealer where I essentially would transfer the gun to the dealer, the dealer would then transfer the gun to you, you'd fill out all the proper paperwork and we would jointly pay him or her some fee, $20, $30, what have you. That's the federal law. Um, the state law goes further, the bill that's been proposed here. So uh, Representative Dave Pinto from St. Paul was the chief author, and it would create two routes for that transaction. One would be what I just said. Mm -hmm. You would have to go to a dealer. In Minnesota, that means um, if that is a handgun or a rifle with a detachable magazine, what Minnesota calls a semi-automatic military-style assault rifle, mm -hmm. Minnesota's term, not mine, Sure. Um, then you would have to have a permit to purchase or permit to carry. We would make the deal at the dealer. Or you and I could make the transaction we, uh, privately without going mm -hmm. to a dealer. We could both fill out a form, a state form. Um, you would show me your permit to carry or permit to purchase. We'd make copies of all this. We would sign it. And then you and I would have to keep this form forever. Mm -hmm. And we'd have to produce it upon request not by subpoena, sure. by request of a law enforcement officer. Seems like a lot of administrative work right. for so, and a now, brief transfer. You're, you're younger than me. Um, you, you probably know where your marriage certificate is. I'm not entirely sure where mine is. Sure. Uh, so now I've committed a gross misdemeanor. If that's my paperwork for this firearms yeah, transaction, right. I've committed a gross misdemeanor. I get to go to jail for a year and lose my gun rights. Oh, my gosh. 20 years from now. Yeah. Unbelievable. Good law? Doesn't feel like it. So uh, the bad guy that, you know, we got a criminal who's prohibited, um, who wants to buy a firearm, and he meets another bad guy behind the Cub Food in northeast sure. Minneapolis. How does this law stop that transaction? It doesn't. Doesn't. And who is this law going to put in jail? Not people that look like you or me. Right, right. And mostly law-abiding citizens or people who make an honest mistake if we're talking about a clerical error in your personal life, right. sending you to jail. The, the statistic that has been cited, I've, I've just found this really interesting and I want to get your opinion on it, about the number of mass shootings in America compared to other countries. 
we live in this meme culture where you throw out an image, it has some information on it, people regard it as truth and share it on social media. And there is this one that is going around that I've, I've seen shared by official Democrat pages and things of that nature of, we've had 260 something shootings in the United States of America compared to like the next highest industrialized country having like three, that dramatic. That seems untrue to me at its face. I don't have research to back it up, but do you know what the definition that they're measuring these I mass do. shootings by? So there's an organization that's funded by the Joyce Foundation. Joyce is a family foundation in Chicago, and one of their areas of focus is gun control. They, they are the principal funder for Protect Minnesota, for okay. example. They give them large six-figure grants every year for their operations. They fund an organization called the Gun Violence Archive. You can find it online. I think it's gvarchive.org or okay. something. But their definition of the mass shooting is any incident where four or more people are wounded. Not okay. killed, wounded. The federal definition, the one used by the FBI, DHS, the Department of Justice, is four or more individuals killed in a single continuous event. So, uh, so that previous non-federally binding recognition from the foundation, that's just arbitrary? It's or? completely arbitrary. Okay. The FBI also factors out um, mass shootings that are gang re or otherwise definitively criminal related because that's not okay. the impetus of the shooting, right? Yeah. If a guy, you know, like uh, one of my favorite movies is Heat, right? Big bank robbery scene. Sure. So they go in and the shooting that then occurs is... It's not really a mass shooting. It's just in, in, incidental to an armed robbery right. of a bank. The FBI would exclude that because it's not the same motivators, um, same pre-attack indicators, motivating factors in that case. Sure. So the, people by, are still dead. People but. are still dead. So the FBI is from the. If you look at the FBI data, there's about 20 mass shootings a year, uh, on average, and it's been consistent since 1979. Hmm. It hasn't gone up or gone down. It's about 20 um, every year. And by the way, they're mostly committed with handguns, not with the AR-15. And that was my other question. So even if you were measuring that 260 number, which again, we said was a totally arbitrary number, totally made up, four people wounded, who, who even knows what that means? What, what percent, because what we're told, right, is, well, you look at the data, in every circumstance like this, it is a military assault style weapon. But how many of even those 260, that completely made up arbitrary number, would be with a military assault, so an AR-15? On average, there's about 250 homicides a year with a rifle of any type. The difference between a rifle of any type and an AR-15 or an AK-47, uh, some semi-automatic variant of that, um, is so small the FBI doesn't track it. <laughs> I mean, they don't so, track it at all. So it's so like 0 0.02 percent of homicides. When we're in, measuring in a year. rifle deaths, you know, we're talking about, uh, you know, your average hunting rifle, right? Yeah, I mean, uh, twenty. I think it was twenty sixteen data. Just here in Minnesota, there's one or two rifle homicides a year. Um, the last year for which we can get full data, I think, is twenty sixteen or twenty seventeen. Okay. One was a bolt action rifle, and one was a twenty two. So there was no AR fifteen or AK forty seven or. Whatever. And the rest you can safely assume were handguns. It, the rest were handguns or there were some shotgun homicides and those kind of things. Fascinating. The amount of bad faith that mm -hmm. is put into these arguments is just absolutely mm -hmm. ludicrous. I and cannot believe it. There's a lot of junk science in the gun violence research or the violence involving firearms research because in a lot of cases, um, and we hear this from Protect Minnesota, they argue a lot there should be a public health uh, approach Study. to public health approach to dealing with sure. suicides and um, violence involving firearms. And so what you wind up with are people who are MDs or others trying to study a criminological problem and not understanding, you know, you have to adjust for population. You have sure. to, you know, got to deal with these other factors that don't really exist in public health research. So locally here, pretty much the day after those shootings, I mentioned before the fundraising emails went out, everybody was posturing, everybody was trying to get their two cents in about what caused this, we need to ban guns, we need to... In Minnesota here, there was actually a brief call for a special session. I'm wondering how close were we to, to having one of those? It seemed like it had somewhat wavering bipartisan support to make it happen. There was no bipartisan support. There was none. There was not a single Republican okay. that said we should have a special session. Okay. Now what, what did happen, and I think that I think the way this was worded was appropriate, um, 
the governor uh, wrote to, I think he spoke with Senator Gazalka actually, and Senator Gazalka said, look, if there's broad bipartisan support for a piece of legislation, then I would not oppose that. Mm -hmm. But there hasn't been a single Republican co-sponsor for any of these bills. In fact, when they did come up for a vote in the conference committee, every Republican voted it down. Sure. Um, Senator Latz and others wrote to Senator Limmer, who chairs the Senate Judiciary Committee, and asked for hearings, which hearings don't require a session. They can have a hearing that has no official business. Sure. Um, we just did this past week on health or on the uh, uh, the DHS. Uh, investigations oh, okay. and such, right? Okay. So Senator Limmer could call a Judiciary Committee hearing anytime he wanted and, and have a discussion about these bills or other bills. And Senator Limmer's response, I thought, was classic. It was, um, I, of course, would be open to solutions that would work, mm -hmm. solutions that would work, yep. that have broad bipartisan support, but these bills have no Republican co-sponsors. Hmm. These bills were not passed by the House. They were stuck in an omnibus bill. And these bills have been heard, it was four or five times in the last five or six years, including in the Senate, what new information would be shared in a hearing that we haven't already heard. Sure. Which I think is, is fair. the truth, right? right? It's been interesting to watch, and I, I, I do, I do want to get your take on this, to watch the Senate caucus really be, uh, they take their lumps here or there it, on, on the way the deals are constructed and that kind of thing, but they really have been a stalwart caucus mm -hmm. uh, against pretty radical gun legislation, would you agree? I would agree, and I think there was definitely, uh, I mean, I know others have, have criticized Senator Gazelka for many things during the course of the last year, as, as you kind of highlighted, or kind of hinted at, um, but he st has stood strong on the gun issue from the very beginning. And I do think the special election in Senate District 11 had something to do with this. Mm -hmm. I mean, um, Senator Rarick beat Stu Lowry yes. by a not insignificant amount. Correct. Guns played a big issue in that. Lowry did fundraisers down here in the metro with big Moms Demand Action fundraisers and supporters, mm -hmm. and Rarick stood strong on things like standard ground and constitutional carry. I think that had is part of what made the difference, and that was noticed by their caucus. So you guys as the Gun Owners Caucus, Brian, what is what does your, your calendar look like for, let's just say, the next month or two? What are you guys up to? What are you working mm -hmm. on? What can we pay attention to? We're at a lot of events right now. We'll be at uh, the Almond Shooters Roundup, which is kind of like the state fair for gun owners this weekend down in Morristown. Mm -hmm. um, you can come shoot a machine gun. We can rent a machine gun and do some shooting. Awesome. And um, There's some cowboy action shooting and other things, but we'll be there. We're there almost every year. Right now, we're going to just a lot of events. I think I'm at, um, I think this week alone, Rob and I are at four different BPOU or countywide uh, Senate district kind of events. Mm -hmm. Rob's going to uh, Bemidji, uh, I think, on Thursday. I'm over in Woodbury speaking to their group. So there's a lot of this outreach going on and kind of providing uh, what's going on state and federal, kind of like mm -hmm. what we're doing here. Um, we're also talking with the legislature about what should we do in 2020. Um, and are there some legislative responses, uh, solutions to some of the things that we've been discussing here that don't involve gun control? Mm -hmm. um, and so we're continuing to kind of provide our insight and advice on that. Very good. Brian Strausser, how can people find out more about the Minnesota Gun Owners Caucus? Sure. Our website is gunowners.mn. Uh, you can find us on Twitter at twitter.com slash mnguncaucus or on Facebook as gunownersmn. Brian, thank you so much for joining the Thanks, Republican Max. Roundtable. Thank you for having me. This has been the Republican Roundtable. I'm your host, Max Reimer. Until next time.